authority at work. Okay, most of you people, probably half of you, don't know what TVA is. Um, but it's the Tennessee Valley Authority. And In 1933, uh, FDR formed this company. It was partly private, it's partly government, and it's a big fiasco because it's like 30 some million dollar, billion dollars in debt. But they have a motto that is, the only good river is a dead river. What they do is they dam everything up, and then they supposedly get lots of hydroelectric power, but they really don't. What they do is they have a lot of coal plants. That's about it. Um, today I want to tell you about um, water, and I'm going to explain from the very beginning. We had this 66095 that um, Chip mentioned was a rusty rock, and it had this type of rust in it, and we thought it was gertite, but every time we examined the uh, composition, we got chlorine. And so what we did is we then got some out and, and measured it. Um, with x-ray diffraction and found out it's a weird mineral called acaganeite and it contains chlorine in the formula and this is the equation that we had uh, to do this and I proved the kinetics of it was fast and everything else and stuff like that so basically I said terrestrial contamination and because I have a big mouth I pushed everything down as far as water was concerned so we, we considered that the water the moon was bone dry and then we started looking at things like agglutinates, and this is agglutinated glass. It has nanophase iron, these itty-bitty particles. You see everything that's white in here. The only one you really see with an optical microscope is the one in the middle, the one micron piece. But these are all parts of the glass is impact produced, and it contains all these nanophase iron particles, and we didn't know how. And what we came up with was this this idea, and it became a paradigm for the next 30 years. And that, that was you had solar wind hydrogen in the soil, we knew this, and so we said, if you take a portion of the soil and you melt it in the presence of hydrogen, you're going to get this reaction. And iron oxygen bonds are the easiest to break. So we said, that's it. And no one considered where, what happened to the water, what happened to the water. I started then in the early 90s looking to find water in the agglutinated glass by FTIR. I was marginally successful, um, but we sort of dropped the whole idea because it was very difficult. For, fast forward 35 years, we got Alberta Saul, who found some hydrogen by SIMS, and now, you know, you can look at the same, same sample over again every 10 years and get completely different answers because we have different instrumentation to bring to bear. And he found these small amounts of hydrogen in these glass beads. Um, the lower one, Jack 74220, and Apollo 15 green glass. Uh, and they, by diffusion calculations, they figured out that there must have been much higher initially, and they calculated amounts of up to 700 parts per million, in theory. Then we come to magmatic appetite. In lunar rocks, you do have appetite. Uh, it's one of the last formed minerals. It contains all the incompatibles, mainly extremely high rares and everything else. But in fact, we started looking for water because the formula that we would get when we did our microprobe analysis, and of course you could not do analysis then for oxygen or hydrogen, we always had a vacancy in the last, um, in the last site there where the F and CL is. Um, and we thought that maybe there's hydroxyl in there. And we kept after that, and you know we thought about it and everything else, but it, it went along for a while. Then 
This is a mesostasis. This is the last stage of a lunar crystallization. It occurs, mesostasis occurs in all lunar basalts in varying degrees. And it's basically the creepy component that's left over after everything else crystallizes. And it has appetite in it. And so we, we looked at some of those appetites with Sims again now, and we found up to 1,600 parts per million. And we went after it a little bit more and started looking at other uh, appetites, as long as, uh, as well as other people doing that. And so we found some, and you know, not being egotistical, but I point out my, my name is on all these. Um, the, uh, with, with Jim Greenwood, we found all sorts of, of uh, hydrogen, and also with, uh, um, with Yang and then Voice, which is the same team there, uh, we found varying degrees of, of hydrogen up to about 1.2 weight percent hydroxyl in the appetite. So this is really important because this stuff is indigenous. This is the stuff that's, that's endogenic. Now, let's talk about what effect does this have? What's, so who gives a damn about endogenic uh, water? The fact is that a little bit of water can go a long ways when it comes to affecting density, viscosity, phase equilibrium. On the left, you see that um, just a half a percent water can, can completely change the viscosity by over an order of magnitude. And so things change. Right now, we have very low viscosity melts, uh, Mari melts, because uh, they've got a whole lot of network uh, breakers in FEO. And the FEO content is higher than any of the terrestrial magnets, so it flows like water. Put a little bit of water in it, it'll flow even more like water. Okay? Um, you see on the right there that approximately uh, 100 ppm water in a magma will lower the uh, solidus by uh, 50, 60, 75 degrees. It can really change a whole lot of things. So it's a small amount, but the fact is we're having to rethink our whole magmatic history, the petrogenesis uh, on the moon. And then, of course, we did DDH on a lot of these samples, and we came up with the idea that that they're cometary water. So the water that we were seeing in these appetites had a DDH. Now, to say it's cometary water, that means that the water must have been put into the lunar system sometime extremely early when the, you had their first great giant impact, and perhaps we had a, a big cometary flux in those days. The Earth had more water, so a few comets didn't help, hurt it. The moon was relatively dry, so a few comets got into it and made a big distinction. But I don't believe D to H ratios very much because hydrogen can go every which way it wants. And so uh, an affected D to H because of its high diffusion rate. So I'm not sure that it's cometary, but that's what we found. And then came, came along with the exciting results from M cube. Carly Peters, uh, her ever optimistic and, and progressive way of thinking of things pushed us into going beyond 2.5 microns to 3 microns, saying, well, we never can tell. We might find a little bit of this or a little bit of that. And lo and behold, we did. And then two of our team members on M-Cube, um, Roger Clark and, and Jessica Sunshine, looked at data that they were collecting. In the case, one was Cassini from way back that Roger had. But he went back and re-looked at it. And wow, he found water. I mean, Jesse found, just found water in her epoxy data. So we have verification, and we came out, and this was the first verification of water, or the first find of water on the moon. Now, let me tell you about it. Everybody's been talking today about solar wind hydrogen and uh, how this supposedly forms the OH on the moon. Now, this is some of my vernacular here, but in the comminution of lunar soil, you smash everything all up. And as you smash something, you have dangling bonds. And these dangling bonds are sitting there, and they're just sort of anxious to grab onto something. Because 45% of the rocks of the moon are oxygen, here's a lot of dangling oxygen bonds, OK? And all these bonds are looking for something to, to grab hold of. And along comes this solar wind, and these dangling bonds jump on, OK? And that's what everybody's been assuming today that happened. Um, this is really a great idea, and you know people have assumed it very much. It's 
Carly called it space do. And so it's going to happen on almost any airless body, potentially, okay? But it's never been proven. There was a paper uh, put out by University of Virginia saying, hey, this solar wind thing doesn't work. Protons won't make water on this. So we did some work to try and disprove that situation. But let me give you a halftime report here. So far, we've talked about o, uh, OH and water and the magmatic components. And that's an important part of the solar problem, water problem. Cometary water, we have perhaps some meteoritic water. 2% of the lunar soil consists of meteoritic in, uh, impo or input. And this input, of course, could have, could be carbonaceous chondrites, could be a lot of things that contain some water. So there's a potential um, input from the meteorites as well. We saw the solar wind bombardment, that's what we just talked about, and I'll go on a little bit more in a, in a minute. And then we saw that one from way back when, that paradigm from 73, that we sort of threw out because we realized in all our experimentation that you couldn't make nanophase iron the way it was distributed in lunar soil by that process, but that undoubtedly did happen. So there is some water that was put into the uh, ablutinates, the milk, and of course some was lost. Oh, I've got to give me time. Um, what we did is we, we took a lunar soil, number one, and this is looking at what FTIR, and it had water in it. Then we heated the heck out of it to 500 degrees, that's two, took out the water. Then we bombarded it with protons, and we got um, an OH signal. But because we had gone from uh, putting the protons in to going to FTR, we went to air, uh, we got criticized. So the next thing we did is we bombarded it with deuterons and we made OD, proving that in fact you could do this. We also did OH. This is our papers finally coming out in EPSL any day now. And in that it also shows that there's a decay of our signal. We can make OH and we can watch it decay over a time period of days to weeks. Okay, so the fact is we're seeing what was just talked about, the decaying of this stuff, uh, the diffusion of it back out and uh, it seems to be time dependent. Elcross, of course, went to the moon and they found some uh, water a little bit later than us. We were se September, they're October. Um, and they're permanently shadow craters. And this again was supposedly cometary, but what portion of it is solar wind hip hopping to the moon, hip hopping to the cold, uh, cold traps. The surface ice that we found from um, Minisar, and you heard this morning uh, a bit about that. Paul Spudis uh, and his team that are not in jail right now are um, <laughs> are continuing to work on this. So, so Ben showed us a whole lot of good stuff about this. But they showed all sorts of, you know, here, here was Paul's, you know, a wee bit optimistic, but 600 million tons of ice and uh, good estimate. Then what we did is we started looking at gluten in the glass, went back again, looking at it. And now we could make some, you know, in detail, made some very fine thin slices, did FTIR on it, were able to see signals with the FTIR of OH. The first time it's been shown that it is, is OH. And what we did is we then did SIMS on these and we confirmed our measurements. So our FTIR measurements were in the ballpark of our SIMS all over these different agglutinated glasses, you have different values. We have value all the way up to a thousand parts per million. That means that here is a reservoir that we hadn't really thought about. That is the, the lunar glass. And this glass in the uh, agglutinated portion of the rocks contains a lot of water. So this was our first, just a direct measurement of OH, and this paper is coming out any day now. So. Basically, I want to talk about the reservoirs of the, the moon, of the uh, water situation on the moon. And you have the lunar regolith. And in there, you have all different inputs. And so what I'm saying is that probably the water content of this lunar soil is much, much higher than we ever thought of. Because there is a reservoir in the agglutinated glass of all these different contributions to the overall budget of water on the moon. And so, water on the moon, 
It's not your grandpa's moon, that's for sure. It's a lot different than we ever thought it was back when I was disproving everybody's idea on water. There's four, five, six sources of water on the moon that we've identified. It's hard to identify them. Our D to H ratios are questionable because of hydrogen diffusion. We have both endogenic and mostly exogenic, but we don't know the proportions of each in reality. And this all impacts on the geochemistry, um, the complete planetary evolution of the moon, and how this thing ever came about that would have so much water that we you know, didn't see before, but now with this latest uh, instrumentation stuff we're starting to find all over the place. Last thing I'd like to do is dedicate this talk to our youth of today. Um, who do you think would ever do something like this? I mean, our, our kids would do it, wouldn't they? How would they get to the moon? This is our return to the moon. And if anybody knows Mike Griffin, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, Mike came up with a saying that his boss took away from him and ran with, and it was called cheaper, faster, better. And that's how the kids are going to do it, and maybe we should take lessons from the young folk. Thank you very much. Uh, Dana, very quickly. So your water concentrations in the glutenitic glass, were those, uh, I mean, what is the concentration in the bulk? Were those, I mean, you had values of 100 or so. Was that just in very localized areas or? Correct. That was, uh, those values were obtained by FTIR. So it was looking through that little, little volume. The size of the portion that we looked at was that square that I showed. And then when we did SIMS,